I must admit to being very pleased with the title of this lecture, but I also have to admit that I borrowed it. Um, the title is taken from a lunch hour lecture on the subject of Bentham and UCL, which was delivered on the 23rd of October 1961 by Professor J.H. Burns, who had just been appointed the first general editor of the new authoritative edition of the collected works of Jeremy Bentham. Professor Burns points out that not only did college possess the mortal remains of Bentham, what Bentham termed his auto-icon, that is a man who is, his, who is his own image, which is, as you all know, I'm sure, deposited in the South Cloisters, but college also possesses the manuscripts, which are deposited in the library. Hence, said Professor Burns, college has not merely the corpse, but the corpus as well. One of the themes in his lectures, um, in his lecture of 1961, was the question of Jeremy Bentham's role in the founding of the college. Professor Burns said, to be found with the body is at least circumstantial evidence of a connection with the fatality. And similarly, to cherish the mortal remains of a distinguished person, as we have piously, if somewhat bizarrely, cherished Bentham's, may well seem to indicate something more intimate than respect for a great thinker. Well, apart from UCL being in possession of the corpse, there are other reasons for thinking that Bentham was the founder of UCL, or rather, the University of London. It was only after Bentham's death that, the, that this institution was demoted from a university to a college, thanks to the union with King's College. This cartoon um, from the time represents King's College with a whole number of fat bishops sat on the bottom of the seesaw. And at the top, University College um, representing um, science and learning. Um, the figure with the broom is Henry Broom, um, always carrying a broom with him. And the person at the top, we assume, is Bentham himself holding his books, and King's College is sliding off, being weighed down by money and interest um, to go and join the devil where they belong. <laughs> Just to show that that really is Bentham, I have a picture here of Bentham's dressing gown. And um, so it's interesting confirmation, both that the figure in the print is Bentham, and this indeed was Bentham's dressing gown. So, what are the reasons for thinking that Bentham founded UCL? Well, one reason, as we've already heard, is that today's lecture is taking place on the anniversary of the founding of the University of London in 1826. More precisely, on the 11th of February 1826, at a general meeting of shareholders or proprietors, the university's deed of settlement was signed and the council formally appointed. A second reason is the imposing painting which dominates the Flaxman Gallery under the dome of the Wilkins Building, no part of the library, but originally the main entrance to the college. The artist was William Tonks, the slave professor. The painting was executed in, 1820, in 1922 and entitled The Founders of University College. Kneeling at the right is the architect, William Wilkins, the poet Thomas Campbell, who was the first person to publicly propose the establishment of a London university, is on the right. On the left stand Henry Broom, once again, and the diarist Henry Crabb Robinson. And there in the centre is, studying the plans, is Jeremy Bentham, complete with straw hat. The others anxiously await his approval. Given, however, that most of the portico appears to have been built at this point, it would have been a bit distressing if Bentham had told them to knock it down and start again. Now, a third reason why we might think Bentham was the founder of University College London is a bit, perhaps a more dubious source, but probably one that were it to be measured under the proposed research excellent framework would be shown to have more impact than any other. And that's the authority here is Ripley's Believe It or Not. Uh, I, I was sent an invitation to the opening of Ripley's Museum in Piccadilly Circus on the 
this was for the 3rd of September 2008, which explained that it would be the strangest grand opening ever held in London. They hadn't thought about the opening of UCL, I don't think, at that point. Anyway, the invitation contained an image of what purported to be Bentham's head and had the following explanation, and this is what it says at the bottom. Though dead for the last 176 years since 1832, the dressed-up bag of bones and dust of what was English philosopher Jeremy Bentham still presides in morbid silence over the Board of Trustees meetings at London's University College Hospital which he founded, as his sightless eyes forever stir out right as various important bits of business come before the board, old Jeremy is consulted, and when no answer comes from behind his grinning teeth, he is recorded as present but not voting. Why? Because he left his entire fortune to the hospital and willed it so, and so he sits. Now, the invitation came in a box. This is a replica box, by the way, and contain the following item. Which purports to be Bentham's head. Made, this is limited edition replica of the mummified head of Jeremy Bentham, handcrafted by the Ripley Visual FX department to commemorate the opening of the Ripley's or Not London Museum. So we'll... We'll leave him there. A fourth reason for thinking Bentham founded UCL may be the way in which Bentham is celebrated within UCL itself. My own faculty, the Faculty of Laws, is located in Bentham House. Its alumni joined the Bentham Association. The main function room in college, once the upper refectory, is now the Jeremy Bentham room. Every couple of years, the Philosophy Department, in conjunction with the British Humanist Society, holds a Bentham Lecture. And UCL has been responsible for marketing the Bentham Key Ring, <laughs> a nice pewter object with Bentham's um, image of Bentham's auto icon on it. We have the Bentham Mug. <laughs> if you ever get one of these, don't put it in the dishwasher you'll soon lose Bentham's image. And of course, the inevitable <laughs> Bentham T-shirt. <laughs> Moving from the um, ridiculous to the sublime, College has four of Bentham's morning rings in its, in its possession. In um, in his will, following the custom of his time, Bentham left a mourning ring to 27 of his friends, relatives, and employees. And here is one of those rings. There are beautiful items. that They were made in 1822, and the silhouette was painted by um, John Field, who was a famous silhouettist of the time. On the reverse is a plait of Bentham's hair, and each of the rings was inscribed with the name of its recipient. This ring was given to John Stuart Mill, and it was spotted in a jeweller's shop in New Orleans by Mr. Michael Phillips, an alumni of the Law's faculty and a fellow of the college, who very kindly has donated it to college. Of the other three rings in UCL's position, an uh, in possession, an uninscribed one was bought from a dealer in 1986. In 1997, I won at auction a ring which belonged to William Tate, who was the Edinburgh publisher of Bentham's 19th century um, edition of his works. And in 1999, I brought back um, from Loughborough, of all places, the ring of Jean Sylvain van de Veer, a Belgian politician. I feel like I'm doing a fairly passable impersonation of the Dark Lord Sauron <laughs> in Lord of the Rings, or so quite where, what, what the equivalent in Middle Earth of Loughborough is, I'm not sure. But it's not that just UCL that makes reference to Bentham, he turns up in some unlikely places. Some of you may have heard of the American rock band Isis. 
I hadn't heard of them until I came across their CDLP entitled Panopticon. The Panopticon is best known as Bentham's model prison. The idea was, in fact, invented by his brother Samuel in order to supervise his workforce when working for Prince Potemkin in the Crimea. Bentham saw this arrangement on a visit there in the late 1780s and adopted and adapted it. The basic idea is that an inspector takes up a central position and the inspected are arranged in a circle around him. The, pop, the panopticon has gained many sinister connotations. It's often and very plausibly regarded as the origin of modern notions of surveillance. As far as Bentham was concerned, and I quote, the more strictly we are watched, the better we behave. If you don't want to be seen, the obvious inference is that you are up to no good. Isis, then, have taken Panopticon as a theme of the title track of this album, and this is the um, inside cover of the LP. And according to the review in the alternative press, Panopticon sees Isis carving off sprawling slabs of cyclical riffery, making their force of nature heaviness all the more effective as it diffuses seamlessly into a cinematic post-rock galaxy of ringing notes and electronic ephemera. Five out of five. <laughs> Given the location of today's lecture in the Darwin Theatre, I like the review from CMJ. Panopticon slowly constructs walls of impenetrable sound and Isis trademark. As each song grows ever more crushing on Panopticon, Isis rebuilds itself, evolving with each Darwinistic step. And... Um, there's been an earlier effort to deal with Panopticon in music, and this was the 1984 album Panopticon by the Greek-American avant-garde performer, artist, vocalist and composer Diamanda Gallus. Copies of this album are extremely scarce, and I've never heard it. I wonder how I can claim to be a true Bentham scholar until I've done so. <laughs> and closer to my home, at least, is a band from Lytham, um, Outlaw. This four-piece neo-punk teenage band have recorded on their 2006 album, Get In The Van, a track entitled Jeremy Bentham. And I'll just give you um, some of the lyrics from that track. I, uh, I heard about a bloke the other day and it got me thinking, when he was dead, they cut off his head. I'm going to have to try, I've got to find out why, his head's in a box. Well, it seems terribly rude to put this Jeremy Jude's head in a box. The lead guitarist and vocalist is Bobby Bentham, the guitarist is Jack Bentham, and the drummer is Will Bentham. Now, moving on, Robert Ludlam, the novelist, is known for his action-packed thrillers. The Bourne films were based on his books. It surprised me to find that Bentham features in a recent book of his, The Bancroft Strategy. Paul Grant Bancroft is the head of a mysterious foundation operating from some remote location in the USA. He's in the process of recruiting his niece, Andrea, to the organisation and says to her, you think about the history of our species and it's striking the way that evil, institutions and practices that we all recognise to be insupportable had been countenanced for centuries. Slavery, the subjugation of women, the extravagant punishment of consensual victimless activities, all in all, hardly an edifying spectacle. But Jeremy Bentham, 200 years ago, called everything right. He was one of the few men of his generation who truly belonged to our moral modernity. Indeed, he was the father to it. And it all began with the simple utilitarian insight. Minimise human suffering and never forget that each person counts for one. Now, Andrea realises, later realises, what the banks of computers at the Foundation's headquarters are doing. My God, Andrea breathed, you're trying to work out the greatest good for the greatest number, the calculus of felicity. <laughs> and where the story revolves around the morality of killing off a few people in order to make lots of people better off. I won't say any more except to say there is a very nice twist at the end. Right, I want to return now to Ripley. Uh, the, its invitation, the claims it makes. Okay, Bentham died in 1822, correct. Second claim, Bentham's mortal remains are a dressed up bag of bones and dust. The auto icon does indeed contain Bentham's articulated skeleton, dressed up in Bentham's own clothes. Bentham intended that his own head should sit on the shoulders of the auto icon. But Tower Thomas... Uh, 
auto iconizer, decided that the head, after it had been preserved, was just too gross to be displayed. Instead, a wax head was commissioned from the French modeler Jacques Talric, and the only part of Bentham's actual body you can see on the auto icon are the strands of hair which dangle down from behind the straw hat. And indeed, Bentham's real head is kept in a box in the college safe. I don't have time to tell you the first time I saw that head, but it was gruesome. Um, but it was never been played with by King's College students um, as a football. <laughs> Third claim, Bentham presides over the trustees of London's University College Hospital and is recorded as present but not voting. This story is usually told in relation to the Council of UCL, so Ripley's, of course, have managed to confuse UCH with UCL. Having said that, it's not true that Bentham presides at meetings of college council. In fact, he does not even attend college council. Well, except once. Um, he attended the 150th anniversary of the founding of the college on the 10th of February, 1976. And um, thanks to Wendy in the UCL record office for letting me take a photograph of the minutes of the meeting of that day and there it says, Mr. Jeremy Bentham present, but not voting. Myth becomes reality. He does also, every now and again, accept invitations to events. For instance, he quite recently attended a dinner during the John Stuart Mill Bicentennial Conference, which we held here in April 2006. Unfortunately, the stirs prevent him gaining access to his own Jeremy Bentham room. Okay, fourth claim from Ripley's, Bentham left his entire fortune to UCH. In fact, Bentham left no money to UCL. He didn't even leave his body. After its creation, the auto icon lived, so to speak, with Thomas Southwood Smith. Smith eventually moved to a smaller house and decided he didn't have enough space to keep his non-paying lodger. The auto icon eventually arrived at UCL in March 1850, donated by Smith. Bentham did leave something to the university, a portion of his library. The books, however, were never catalogued separately from the main collection. Only a handful have been traced. So if, in response to Ripley's believe it or not, we have to say not, surely we can believe the Tonks picture of Bentham giving his approval to the plans for the college. Once again, no, this scene is imagined. Bentham never met Wilkins the architect, and as yet no one has discovered any, any evidence that he ever visited the college, although he did used to go out jogging, so uh, it would be nice to think that he actually sort of jogged up Gower Street and did take a look at the college as it was being built. I mean, Bentham was not much involved in the practical activities that surrounded the foundation of the university. He did buy a share in the university, costing him £100, but thereby merely joined the ranks of over a 1,000 shareholders or proprietors. In September 1827, Bentham tried to persuade Henry Broom, who was one of the real movers and shakers, to appoint John Browring to the chair of English literature possibly combined with the post of Secretary for Foreign Correspondence, which Bentham suggested should be established. Bowring's connection, says Bentham, would make him peculiarly fitted for this post, whose primary task would be, and I quote Bentham, to engage men of various foreign nations to send their sons to London for the finish of their education. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? Recruitment of overseas students. <laughs> I wonder if it'll catch on. And anyway, Broom was distinctly lukewarm. He seems to have regarded Bowring as what might be described as a squirmy toad. And Bentham soon gave up his support for Bowring's appointment. You can see the bust on that um, drawing. Um, I like to think it's the same bust which is now in the Bentham project. In fact, in my office, he looks at me all the time. Now, Bentham does have a claim, however, to be the spiritual although that's not the word he himself would have approved of, the spiritual founder of UCL. In 1817, Bentham published a work entitled Cresta Mathia. And here is one of the 
the tables from that work. And he set out proposals for a new school for children of the middling and higher ranks, which would concentrate on useful learning. He offered his back garden as a place where the school could be built. He did have a big back garden. And the people who were involved in the attempt to establish the Prestomatic School were very much the same people who were involved in the founding of the university. The first historian of UCL, um, Hale Bellot, thought that Bentham's plan for a Crestomatic school, and I quote him, was in many respects a forecast of the University of London. The school, said Bellot, was to serve the middling classes. It was to be launched by a body of shareholders in a joint stock company. It was to be cheap and in the end self-supporting. By virtue of being non-residential, it was to be free from the embarrassing obligation to provide religious teaching. It was to attend it was to useful and not merely to ornamental instruction. And it was therefore to educate its pupils in a great variety of subjects at that date commonly recognised as part even, not commonly recognised as part even of a university curriculum. In spite of the strange jargon with which it is edged about, no reader of the Crestomathea can fail to perceive in it a gleam of extraordinary freshness. So what's important is not that Bentham didn't take it upon himself to become involved in the practical arrangements for the foundation of the University of London. And it, should be not, it shouldn't be forgotten that he was nearly 80 years old at this time. But more important was that his ideas provided the inspiration for those who were involved. Bentham himself was very much reacting against his own experience of education. As a boarder at Westminster School and then as a 12-year-old when he was sent to Queen's College, Oxford. It was thought at the time that he was the youngest person ever to have gone up to Oxford. What little formal education he received was mostly theology and dead languages. Bentham himself was keenly interested in chemistry and botany. Those were the sorts of subjects he thought should be taught in the Crestomathic School. As for the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, they were the great public nuisances. One of his most distressing experiences was being forced in 1765 to subscribe to the 39 articles of the Church of England in order to take his degree. This was the most notable occasion on which he was forced to compromise his intellectual integrity. The problem was the involvement of the Church of England in education. The Church wasn't interested in truth in Bentham's view, but in maintaining its wealth, power and influence. His response, his repost didn't appear for over 50 years, but it eventually came in the work entitled Church of Englandism and its Catechism Examined, published in 1818 which contained a, a wide-ranging critique of the church. Bentham condemned the church's policy of forcing children in its schools, or more precisely, the schools of the National Society, to learn the catechism and thereby to declare their belief in what Bentham considered to be nonsense. While corrupting the minds of the children of Church of Englandists, this system excluded the children of non-Church of Englandists from a primary education, just as the two Church of England universities excluded non-Church of Englandists from a university education. Bentham called for the euthanasia of the Church of England. As clerical vacancies occurred, their offices should, not, should simply be abolished. He advocated the same happy death for the universities. As posts became vacant, they should simply not be filled. Rooms in colleges might be offered to more worthy incumbents, such as veterans from the army or navy. For Bentham, the point was to divorce religion from education, just as it was to divorce religion from legislation. As he said, theology had about as much relevance to a book of legislation as it did to a book of cookery. The radical but tolerant secularism was a fundamental ingredient of Bentham's thought and was the basis on which this college was founded. So UCL has Bentham's corpse, or at least some of it. UCL also has Bentham's corpus, or at least most of it. UCL Library contains about 60,000 folios of Bentham's manuscripts. Since Bentham destroyed the manuscripts as the works that he published himself, of which there were over 40, 
The folios in the Bentham papers represent works that either were never published by Bentham himself or were published by editors, either during his lifetime or since. And there are another 12,500 folios in the British Library. But once again, the corpus was not left to UCL by Bentham. In his will, Bentham appointed John Bowring as his literary executor, with instructions to produce a new edition of his works. Bowring found out the, the work to a variety of editors, and an 11 volume of edition of the works of Jeremy Bentham was published by Tate at Edinburgh between 1838 and 1843, and then reissued as a complete set in 1843. In 1849, one year before the auto icon arrived, Bowring deposited Bentham's manuscripts in the college library. The Bowring edition is poorly edited and is far from complete. Bowring decided, for instance, to exclude Bentham's writings on religion on the grounds that they would upset too many of its potential readers. As the 19th century readers of the Bowring edition seem to have been few and far between, Perhaps Bowring had little need to worry. But eventually, after some attempts in the 1930s to edit, uh, to create, to, to make a new edition of um, Bentham's works, um, it was really only in the late 1950s that serious thought was once again given to the question of what to do with the Bentham papers. The philosopher A.J. Eyre told the college authorities that they must either go ahead and edit the Bentham manuscripts or sell them to the Americans. College established the Bentham Committee in order to oversee the preparation of the new complete edition. Its first meeting took place on the 19th of October 1959. Professor Burns was appointed the first general editor in 1961. The committee is still going strong, holding its 67th meeting on the 12th of June last year. Professor Joe Wolf from Philosophy is the chair of the committee. I'm the fourth general editor. And um, we've produced 26 volumes to date, three more at the press. We've done work on another dozen. And my last calculation on the back of an envelope suggested that in total there will be 68 volumes. I hate to sort of do these figures, but 50 years to do 26 and another 40 to go well. Anyway, the edition is divided into two parts. There are correspondence and works. So Bentham's correspondence, we've done 12 volumes today, taking it up to within four years of Bentham's death. And um, so we publish all the letters to and from Bentham. And there's an example of a letter here, um, addressed from QSP, which was Bentham's house, Queen Square Place in Westminster in 1820. And it's addressed to dear Aspasia. Aspasia was the friend, lover, confidant, advisor of Pericles. Um, it was Bentham's nickname for Sarah Austin, the wife of John Austin, the first professor of jurisprudence here at UCL. And you can see the, um, if you can read it, you can see the playful tone, come to the embrace of poor old great grandpapa on Sunday. If your husband behaves well, bid him attend you. Um, so um, there's Bentham writing um, well into, in, into, his, into his 70s. Um, um, there's, oh, I've got my slides the wrong way around, but there's a picture of the collected works volumes which we're producing. And um, here's another letter, a rather better image, but this is from 1831, or is it 1830? It's difficult to read. Um, as he got older, his handwriting got more and more difficult. If you can read that, see me afterwards, we may have a job for you. <laughs> And the other part is the works based on Bentham's works printed by Bentham himself in his lifetime and on Bentham's um, own manuscripts. This is um, a manuscript dating from about 1780. And in the first paragraph contains what's become a very famous definition of law. But you can say that where Bentham reworks his material by um, writing it out, going over it, crossing through, adding material um, over the line, and 
part of our job as, as editors is to get a readable text from these manuscripts. <coughs> That's a, a 1780 manuscript. After about 1800, Bentham started to date his manuscripts, and here we have one from 1823. And this manuscript was written for Greece. Bentham um, offered advice to the legislators of, of Greece, and um, any, he was trying to get someone to ask him to codify for them. He wanted to draw up a complete code of laws for any nation which was professing liberal opinions. And um, the Portuguese Cortes actually asked him to do that in 1821. Um, but by 1823, his attention had moved, moved to um, Greece. So that's an example of a later manuscript. And that manuscript has been published in one of our volumes. And there on the right, you see um, the finished product. We also provide annotation uh, of historical events and characters. There's no annotation on that page. But um, that, in a nutshell, is the work of the Bentham Project. And we've just um, won a grant from the Arts and Humanities Research Council to put a transcription tool online so that everyone will have the chance to transcribe Bentham manuscripts which have never been transcribed before. There are about 40,000 Bentham manuscripts which people haven't read. Um, and it's impossible for scholars to, 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 to use this material because you just can't sit down and read it. It takes a lot of hard work just to transcribe one sheet of this material. So our idea is to do a, a crowdsourcing exercise whereby we will place digital images of manuscripts online and you can all come along and try and read it, produce a transcript, submit it to the Bentham Project and if we accept your transcript, you'll get a little star. Well, you see how many stars you can build up. <laughs> the, um, we also have a mass of transcripts which are sitting in really uh, virtually unsearchable um, files. And another part of the project will be to create an ideas bank. So when you want to know um, what Bentham thought about a particular subject or want um, some ideas, um, to engage with on a particular subject, hopefully you'll be able to come to the Bentham Ideas Bank and think, oh, well, what did Bentham write on this subject? You know, what did he think about penal law? Unfortunately, my time's run out because I was going to tell you about Bentham's views on sex, which are extremely um, radical. Um, basically, look, his view was to um, encourage non-procreative sexual activity on the grounds that that would increase happiness and not cause any pain. But that's um, sort of the next bunch of manuscript which I, I, I would like to edit. There are sort of five or six hundred sheets of unedited manuscript in the, in the collection, unread on this subject. And um, when somebody was cataloguing this material in the 1920s, they wrote on the cover, would be prosecuted if published now. So let me conclude by saying Bentham's significance for UCL doesn't perhaps lie so much in the fact that we have his corpse, but that we have his corpus, and that the corpus represents one of the most important unedited collections of manuscripts existent in the world today. Both from the point of view of historical importance and contemporary significance, Bentham's an immense figure, and the new scholarly edition of his work is deepening our appreciation of the sheer power, subtlety, and value of his thought. So perhaps in the end, the question is just as, appro well, as the question, what has Bentham done for UCL? It's just as appropriate to ask, what has UCL done for Bentham? And the reason that UCL has done and is doing this, supporting the work of the new edition of Bentham's works, is not because of some pious or bizarre attachment to a foundation myth, but because of a recognition of the sheer importance of the ideas of perhaps the greatest philosopher and reformer of modern times. And if UCL wishes to define its mission for the future, it could do much worse than look to the vision that inspired its past. Thank you very much for your patience.